Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar on improving machine shop efficiencies with CICG. I am Amanda Goyette. I'm an admin assistant here at AERA, and I will be helping moderate today's event with my colleague, Rob Monroe. Hey, everyone. Yeah, Rob Monroe here. I look after membership and technical development over at AERA, and I want to welcome you to today's webinar. Another thing that we have uh, is our Engine Professional Magazine. Uh, those of you should have got our Q2 edition that, that came out in the mail here, oh, probably about three weeks ago or so. We're actually just finished up Q3. It's at the printers, uh, so you're going to see that probably in the next three weeks or so. That'll be rolling through, and you'll see Q3. Great articles in there. There's application-driven articles, stuff that you can apply right to your shop. So, for example, uh, Matt actually did an article, uh, our presenter today, in our Q2 edition of Engine Professional, Another cool thing, uh, a lot of our techs, uh, we are we just about are at 14,000 engines now in Process Pro. So probably just a little bit later this year, we're going to hit 14,000. Process Pro, our engine spec software, uh, there is technical bulletins in there. We've got all kinds of casting number information. Uh, all your specifications are in there. So if you're not using Process Pro and you are a member of AERA, uh, let us know. We, we can send you a 30-day free trial if you're a member, and we'll let you just try it out so that you can have a look at it. And if you want more information on Process Pro, just go over to this website here, www.processpro.com, and check that out. All right, well, I'm going to bring on Matt Bland from CICG, and Matt specializes in ways that you can help remove waste and inefficiencies. And I really enjoyed doing the article with Matt um, for for our Q2 magazine Matt's a specialist in, you know, how to, uh, how to try to, you know, basically how to get more efficient. And uh, today he's going to talk with you about how to do that. So, Matt, how are things going today? <clears throat> going great. Thanks, Rob. Hopefully you guys can, can hear me well. Um, don't worry, I'll turn the webcam off pretty soon. I don't, I don't know that anyone wants to see my face for too long. But, um, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Uh, just to give a little bit of background, um, so I actually, I worked for about 11 years. I worked for Jasper Engines and Transmissions. I uh, still live here in Jasper, Indiana, and uh, that was an awesome experience. I had the opportunity to give a little plug. I went through uh, some of the virtual uh, machine head certifications and stuff like that for uh, AERA, so I was excited to do that. And um Really happy to work with you guys on to on making this presentation. So I worked with CICG uh, for about two years, and it's been a great opportunity to go around to different companies, uh, and you know some very large and some small. I'm sure just like some of the people that are on the call today, uh, some that are part of you know multi-billion-dollar holding companies, and some that are you know job shops. They're they're not doing engines and transmissions necessarily, but uh, like injection molding type stuff and different things like that. So uh, small companies where there's six or seven people working on the shop floor and some where there's a couple hundred. So uh, it's it's definitely cool to see how, no matter what size they are, there are opportunities to to kind of change the business and, and make improvements, some big, some small, but continually trying to make some improvements. Um, <clears throat> so... I'll go through and um, we'll talk about some of this. And obviously, if there are questions, I'm happy to, to kind of take those at the end. And hopefully, this will be some uh, some benefit to everyone. And, and we'll go through this. So yeah, turn this camera off a little bit there. All right. So um, just like I talked about uh, to lead off the article, uh, one of the things we often do when we go into a company is we like to go to the people doing the jobs, the operators. And kind of ask, you know, so did you did you win today? How do you know whether you won or lost today? What or even what's your goal today? And uh, maybe you would be surprised, maybe you wouldn't be surprised to know that very often when we ask, there's a lot of people who don't have the answer. And, and so it would be concerning to me as a business owner that the guy that's doing the work that's actually providing value doesn't know what our what our goal is that day or what we're trying to accomplish. And then if they don't know that, then they certainly won't know if they're winning or losing, if they're doing well or if they're off track. So I, I think it's very, very important to uh, to understand that. So it would kind of give the example of, you know, you know, millions and millions and probably almost a billion people watched the World Cup, which was a really good game this past year. Sometimes not always that way, but um, it was a great game. 
Um, and if they didn't know the score and realize that they were going to have to go to penalty kicks, um, which takes then strategy to decide who's going to kick when and how you're going to do that. Um, if they didn't know what was going on, then they probably would have made, uh, maybe they made it, would have made the right decision. Maybe they would have made a terrible decision, but you know, getting data, getting information helps us make decisions, right? So one of the things I, I've heard say, I, I, I probably stole it from someone. I won't say I came up with it, but is that data drives decisions and good data drives good decisions. So a lot of driving improvement and doing those things requires that we that we get good data uh, so that we can make good decisions. And that's probably, I would say, and maybe if you were looking at your, your operation or your company or your shop right now, you might think, well, we don't have good data. But I can tell you, like I've said, I've dealt with very large companies and they don't have good data either. So if you feel like you're in that spot, uh, don't worry, you have a lot of opportunity and it, it can go great for you, uh, even if you don't feel like you're, you're where you want to be right now. Um, obviously, for, for Lionel Messi, it was a great opportunity. He won and kind of got that, got that uh, monkey off his back of winning the World Cup and, and uh, showing that he might be one of the greatest soccer players to, to play. So, or footballers, I guess, however you want to, however you want to say that. So, you know, kind of what is lean? Um, lean or continuous improvement is a management philosophy focused on reducing what has been commonly called the eight forms of waste. So what you'll hear me say a lot today is I'll talk about waste and I'll talk about uh, the opposite of that, which would be value added activity. Waste you could consider non-value added activity. <clears throat> and we're gonna talk a little bit about what that means in just a moment here. But let's talk briefly about the eight forms of waste. Now there are plenty of people who have come up with a lot of different, um, a lot of different sayings to to depict this. One of the ones we've used is Tim Woods. Another one is downtime. So there's a lot of different acronyms that are out there, uh, but they all mean the same thing. They just arrange the letters differently. So when we're looking at waste in anything, not just a manufacturing setting, but it could be in a service setting, um, it could be in a hospital setting. It could be in a restaurant, wherever it is, you know, anything that we're doing, there's always, there's some waste or some non-value added activity in it. So this just breaks it down into a couple of different categories. I won't delve into every single one of them um, in this presentation necessarily, but some of the big ones that we might consider, you know, transportation, just moving product around um, from one location to another, perhaps separate facilities or just even within a facility. Um, moving it from one end of the building to the other. And what makes it a waste is it the fact that we have to move it, right? Now, it may be necessary because unless someone's figured out a way to levitate product around, someone's going to have to move it. And so you're going to have to pay someone to do that, right? So that's waste. Uh, the customer doesn't care that you have to do that. So you're not making any money off of it. So that's where you talk about it doesn't bring you any value. Um, it just takes it away from value because now you're paying someone to move something around, but it generates no revenue for you. Inventory. So this is probably a very big one. Um, building up uh, large piles of inventory. And, you know, this was a bit thrown into the mix with COVID because supply chains got so out of whack that a lot of people who tried to reduce inventory were probably carrying more inventory than they needed just to protect themselves against parts outages and stuff like that. So this one probably is a little bit fluid, but the idea is the inventory that I have on my shelf, it's costing me money, whether it's finished product inventory or whether it's raw material inventory. It, it, it doesn't generate me any revenue, it's costing me money. So I want to find the right balance between having what my customer wants when they need it, um, as well as sometimes it might take me a long time to produce it, so I have to balance that out. But understanding that too much inventory is a waste and that it generates no value. Um, one of the bigger ones I would say that we often say is one of, one of the worst is probably overproduction. And the reason that we say that is when I, so if I build or I produce more than my customer has asked for or more than I need. So what that means is if I overproduce a product, now I have to move it around. So now I have transportation, I have to store it in inventory somewhere, and sometimes I don't have enough space to store it. So now it's just piling up in different places. And what that'll tend, that could also lead to some safety issues. Uh, I, for, for sure, I've seen 
places where pallets are piled up or materials are piled up and someone inevitably trips on it or it's not where it's supposed to be and someone runs into it. So many different things that can happen uh, when I overproduce product. Um, and traditionally, probably about 15, 20 years ago, they only talked about the seven forms of waste. Um, so which would have just been Tim Wood here, let's say. The eighth form of waste has kind of come about, um, like I said, in the last 15 to 20 years, which is skills. Um, other times it's called underutilized people. So the idea behind that is, is within your company or your business, you have a lot of people that have a lot of different skill sets. And if we're not finding ways to tap into their skill sets, then we're missing out on opportunities. Um, you might have someone who, for instance, really enjoys in their spare time doing coding, computer coding, or different things like that. Well, in your business, you may have a need for an IT support or someone who at least can help out a little bit. Um, well, there you have an opportunity to understand, oh, if we give him a little bit more training, he now is a dual, dual player for us and he can help us out in other ways. But if I'm not trying to evaluate those skills and if I'm not trying to develop those skills or let people also solve the problems that we encounter, then I'm going to be a weaker company for that. So it's, that's really kind of come to the forefront last, you know, last decade or so or two. Um, and especially recently now. Um, I think you'll find more than likely, I mean, I don't know everyone's business, but I think one of the things we hear is it's hard to get people, obviously, and then it's hard to retain people because sometimes we're not really sure what they're looking for. Um, traditionally, we've always thought if someone's doing well in your company, that means they want to grow into more leadership responsibility. Um, I think what you'll find is there are some people that that's 100% true and that there are some people who don't really necessarily care about more responsibility they want to learn more things and they want to develop greater skill sets and keep themselves engaged a little bit more. So I think as a business owner or a leader, you have to find ways to understand that and help to engage them in that. And it can be a win-win for both the company and the individual. So that's, those are kind of the waste. Um, and obviously when we talk about lean or continuous improvement, you know, the Toyota Manufacturing Company is very big into that um, and helped to propel it very quickly. They certainly weren't the inventors of it. Um, people have always been looking for more efficient ways to do things for a long time, not just when Toyota came along, but they certainly have taken the discipline aspect of it. And that's helped them to kind of, you know, grow by leaps and bounds in that regard. So one of the philosophies that they have about waste is that waste is anything other than the minimum amount of equipment, materials, parts, space, and workers' time, which are absolutely essential to add value to the product. So this is where I'm circling back to the idea of value-added activity versus non-value-added activity. Now, I'll put this kind of little caveat or warning out there. So oftentimes when we go into a business and we talk about what's value added and what's non-value added, the operator, the guy doing the job, the machinist, sometimes when they hear someone say, well, that's not value added, you know, to pick up a head or to load a block into a CNC, I certainly have to do it, but it's not really bringing any value. I'm not changing the product at all. I'm just moving it and putting it there. As a customer, I wouldn't care whether someone has to pay for a robot to do it or whether someone has to have an operator or a human load up and do it. It doesn't matter to me. I just want to pay for turning that, you know, when when that cutter is actually making chips and shavings, that's the only thing I care about as a customer because that's changing the product. Now it's now it's turning into a product that I want. Prior to that, it doesn't really matter to me. And sometimes operators, machinists, it can seem like you're saying that they're not doing a good job where they can take it personally that what they do doesn't matter. And that's a, that's a different thing. The idea between value and non-value added is really just a critical way to look at everything that you do as a company. So if I can look at my processes or my company and really try to understand and take the emotion out of it and say, what is actually providing value to my customer? And the flip side, the, the point of that is your customer is the one that determines whether it's value added or not. So a lot of times we like to do things because we think it's what the customer wants, but 
that also requires us to talk to them and understand their needs and what they're looking for. That may lead us to stop doing something that we, we weren't doing. I'll give you an example of that with some of the, one of the clients we're working with. A lot of clients we work with are right now in the wire and cable industry. Um, so a company that provides overhead or underground cable, I should say, to the state of Florida. So to, to Florida Power and Light. So they have a jacket and then they coat over that jacket with neutrals, other copper wires, different things like that. So within this inner jacket, they had printed the name of the company, Florida Power and Light. So what they did is they went and asked Florida Power and Light, hey, why are we doing this? Because the problem is the product that they had to print on, it could they could use that for a lot of other uh, part numbers and a lot of other customers, but because they print their, their other customer's name on it, they obviously cannot use it for other customers. So as they talked to Florida Power and Light, said, hey, do you, you know, why are you want this? Well, we just want uh, traceability. Ironically, they said, well, sometimes we have people steal because there's a lot of copper in those wires. And obviously people are stealing, stealing copper and trying to sell it and make money. So um, they said, well, we've had people steal them out. And that's the way when the police come, we can prove that it was ours or for insurance purposes or whatever. Well, because our client understood that, they could say, well, hey, just so you know, we have traceability in a different way on all of your products. And they said, oh, that's fine. So you don't have to print that on there anymore. Automatically, our client became way more competitive because they, they were able to reduce their inventory and increase their um, throughput time to get more product to that customer. So really understanding what our, our customers want and what they're willing to pay for helps us go back through our processes and understand what brings value and what doesn't bring value. So that's going to be key in everything that we do to try and improve. So it's kind of a good foundation in that regard. So the example I give, and what we'll kind of talk a little bit more about is, so how do I get started? What's something simple and basic that I can do uh, to try and improve my efficiency, which ultimately should be increasing um, my, my profits uh, in all reality. So I might have the same amount of revenue, but now my cost is less, or hopefully it might help me to increase my revenue. Um, and now I'm seeing better bottom line growth. So what we'll talk about is one, I need to identify a critical place to start. I need to set a specific and measurable goal. Then I need to start tracking, you know, my performance uh, against that goal and try and figure out how I can improve that. And then once I start doing so, I need to sustain those efforts. And then what you'll hear us as CICG talk a lot about is we need to celebrate those wins because ultimately, all the people that are doing the job for you, if it's an inefficient process, that's because the company has given them an inefficient process. So it's up to the company to help figure out with them how to make this process more efficient. And then let's celebrate those things together. Um, and you can do many different ways to, to find those fun things out, You know, whether it's bringing in food for them, um, setting pretty high goals. Um, and I think I gave this example in the article and I, I we did it when I was at Jasper Engines. This was one of the things that we ended up doing is the leadership team, myself and my leaders, um, because to, as a recognition for all the good work people had done, we put ourselves in a dunk tank and we did a big kind of little fair for, for some of our workers. And uh, I tell you, all, all the little kids, all they did was sit there and hit that thing and make us drop in that water. It was pretty rough, but it was fun. And you know, I think just find creative ways that's going to be of value to, to the people you work with. And that'll help this go even faster and help your improvement grow even more. So we're gonna talk right now about how to identify a critical place to start. So in the example I gave in the article, I said, well, let's talk about, you know, if I have a piece of equipment in my, in my shop, let's say in this case, it's a CNC machine. So first things first, I mentioned before, I need to get good data. It's hard to make any improvements when I don't know what I'm doing right now. So this is also what you might call establishing a baseline. So I want to start tracking how many times my machine is actually running. Uh, so, you know, so I start tracking that and that's going to tell me kind of my uptime. You know, how many minutes do I have in the day and how many of those minutes is this piece of critical equipment actually functioning and running? You know, where that cutters is cutting, you know, how long does that happen? Not when it's probing, not when it's doing any of that stuff, but when is it actually cutting? 
So then I start tracking that and I get it and okay, in this example, I don't know how long your day is, but I used a day of 450 minutes. So in this case, my average is about 44%. So I'm running at about 44% uptime, let's say, in the last couple of weeks. So what I then want to do is, okay, well, what do I want to do? What's my goal? I will tell you a standard within the industry around world-class uptime. And there's other ways to measure this, um, whether it's a, a, a metric called OEE about equipment efficiency, overall equipment efficiency that might take into account quality as well. You know, so not only am I producing, but am I producing good parts and that kind of factors into, you know, my uptime. But if we just want to start simple and just say, how much time do I have to run and how much time am I actually running? And let's, let's see if we can make that better. So I want to set a goal. So 80% is typically set up as a world-class efficiency um, rating. So I think that could be a good goal to start with. So if I say my current run time is 200 minutes and I want to get to 360 minutes of runtime. So I don't know what your revenue would be. I made this up obviously just because it made the math really easy at $10. So, so I know if I can make my revenue generated from that is $10 a minute, just as an example. So if I can increase it by 160 minutes, that would give me every day an extra $1,600 in revenue. You know, if it's a 250 day working year, um, then that would give me an extra $400,000 in yearly revenue just off one piece of equipment. Like I said, I'm making up these dollar figures. Perhaps yours is a lot less. Maybe it's even a little bit more. I'm not sure. But the, I, the concept is I need to understand what's the business case because why I want to do it. So if my revenue per minute were 50 cents, I don't know that this is an area that I would want to go work in. All right. So we got to make sure that whatever I'm going to do is going to be worth my time doing it. Um, because time and resources is a limited commodity unless you have unlimited time you have unlimited people to work on your problems which if you do that would be great i'd love to come see your operation because that would be uh, definitely different than anyone else that i've talked with but we know that that's a finite resource so i really need to be purposeful on where i'm going to spend my time so i it's important to understand the business case um, to what i want to do so that it makes sense so now that i've set a goal now I'm gonna track, all right, I have my goal. I'm gonna track the reasons why I may not be hitting the goal. So I start tracking that every day. Um, and so in this one, we'll see, okay, I had this one, but I had to change tooling five times. So now I wanna start figuring out how do I fix that? Well, maybe I go to look at how I'm scheduling my jobs and say, okay, right now, the quickest thing I can do is try and plan that better. So I maybe don't have as many tooling changes as I'm having um, so that I can try and increase that. Now, if you're running more, you know, as job shops and things like that, you may not have that luxury to be able to do that. And more than likely, even if you aren't really a job shop and you do have a lot of high volume product that you run through, chances are because of product availability and parts availability, you're probably gonna find yourself at times not being able to run your optimal schedule that you'd like to run. So what I can do instead then is, okay, well, let me figure out how can I make my tooling changes much faster. So that, and in the end, I don't care what my mix is because I'm able to be flexible. So now when I'm bringing on new product and different things, I can fold that into my quick changeover process. And that will help me to be way more competitive uh, according to my competition. So that's another thing that Lean helps me do is it helps me not only understand what my customer values, but now I can find ways to get quicker to market and I can gain competitive advantages and start to gain market share without having to do more work and hire more people. And that's really what most people are looking for right now, because once again, hiring people is a massive struggle for a lot of companies, large companies and small companies alike. So the what I can use these tools for is to increase my lean skills and continuous improvement skills so that I can produce more with the same amount that I have now and or even um, have the opportunity to have less resources and produce more. Now I can repurpose someone. So at CICG, we like to joke that we don't practice, we practice lean, we don't practice mean. So the point of improving my process isn't so that I can fire someone and have less people. It's if I have that opportunity where now I freed up a person, I can now redeploy them in a different way that helps strengthen the company. 
um, work on projects that I haven't had time to work on because we've been too busy working in the business to work on the business. So this is a way to free that up once again without increasing my labor dollars. So we go look at here, okay, we had a crashed head. We may have to figure something out. Is there a maintenance thing we need to be doing? Was, there, was, a, was the program wrong? Did they select the wrong program? Did they not install? Did, was there a problem with the equipment where they lost a little bit of air? I don't know what it is, but now I'm understanding. And now I want to try and fix that, figure out how can I prevent that from happening again? And then I maybe I had a quality issue one day that I, you know, there was a problem. So now we want to go and understand, okay, why did that quality issue happen? What do we need to put in place to prevent that from happening again? And one thing I want to call people's attention to, if you'll notice here on this available time, this day of, you know, the of February 3rd, uh, the, the available time was less, was about an hour less that day. And the reason I did that is to, is to say, you need to also factor in for scheduled downtime. So if I know I'm going to be down because I have to clean out the machine, I have to, you know, re-put the fluids in, whatever it is I need to do, I need to plan to do that so that I'm not chasing the wrong problem because it could look like I didn't hit my uptime goal very much at all. You know, so let's say my goal that day is actually 312 minutes as opposed to 360. Because what I don't want to do is let's say I, I only ran for 315 minutes that day. Well, if I don't adjust my goal for a scheduled downtime, now that's a problem that I'm going to try to work on. And it really wasn't a problem. So that's where I go back to good data drives good decisions. So, and I also will put the plug in there. You need to make sure you're taking care of your equipment so that it's staying up for longer and you're taking that time now so that you're not, you know, when you choose to do it rather than it being down because of lack, because of neglect or lack of maintenance. And now all of a sudden it's probably going to be, and it always happens in the critical time when you have a critical order or something like that that has to go out. It never happens when you have plenty of time. So, Knowing that, let's plan for it and let's let's make it a part of what we do. So now that I've done that, it's important to sustain my results and to celebrate that. So one of the things we do is, you know, this, there's this wheel of sustainment, so to speak, that we use. And the recognition part is a huge part of that opportunity. Um, you know, I think and it's not necessarily, I know one of the challenges is like, oh man, are we talking about giving a, um, a trophy to everyone. No, we set goals. So if I have an area that they want to increase their uptime, great. Let's set a goal. And if you guys hit your goal for the week or four out of five days, let's have a celebration and let them choose what that is. Um, maybe it's they get a bonus. Maybe it's they get you know lunch or dinner, um, or maybe they can you know parlay that and say, all right, well, let's say if we do it for two weeks, we get a bigger prize if we can hit this goal for two weeks. Um, but whatever it is, I think one of the keys I learned, and I, I'll credit Jasper Engines and Transmissions for this, I think one of the great things I learned was if you use your team, you don't have to come up with all of these things. I think what I felt like there was a big burden as a leader to come up with how we can recognize people and how we can celebrate people. And, you know, it's not something I felt like I did a good job of. So I struggled to come up with those ideas and it was a big burden. But when I decided to get a team together of, you know, some of our, you know, shop floor people or, you know, just kind of other levels of leadership and said, hey, I want you guys to come up with these. I'll delegate that to you because you can they come up with much better ideas than I ever did. And to those people, it was a, it was a fun thing to be a part of. And it just helped the culture. And they started looking for opportunities to do things better. That's really the key. When you can have multiple people striving to look for small improvements that you can make. If you've ever looked at lean, you might see a word of Kaizen, you know, a Japanese word that really kind of just means small good change along those lines. So it doesn't have to be this radical step that you have to take. Just small little improvements stacked up over time will yield some amazing results, but you got to create the environment where people want to do that and you empower them. And part of empowerment is to give them some knowledge and some skill sets on how to do that. So I think that's one of the things, obviously, with CICG, it's one of the things we help people with. So, um, so as like I said, just to recap a little bit, how we can improve some efficiency. One, we need to identify a critical starting place. We need to set a specific and measurable goal 
that will help us establish our baseline. And then we need to start tracking how we perform against that baseline. And the hope is because I have a baseline, I can show some improvement and I can see that. The trouble is if you never establish a baseline, it's obviously really hard to tell whether you made any improvement whatsoever because you don't know where your jump off point was, where your starting point was. So once I understand why we're not meeting the goal and then starting to figure out how do I solve these problems, and what I would put a plug in here for as well is there's two different um, actions that you can take. So what you hear a lot in the quality world is corrective actions. So whenever I encounter a problem, there's always a short-term corrective action and a long-term corrective action. Typically, your short-term corrective action is something that you're going to put in place that's to protect your customer right away. We encountered a problem, a quality issue, so we're going to have 100% inspection. Someone's got to look at this part 100% of the time. And that's sometimes as far as we go. But the problem is focus is a limited resource. So it's like a flashlight. If I am shining my light in one area, I can see that clearly. But if I change my focus and I, I swivel that flashlight around, I'm going to focus on something else. But whatever I was looking at now is a little bit dark. and I may not be able to see it. So doing 100% inspection of something is really just a short-term answer. What we need to do is take that next step and how do we figure out how we build quality into our processes so that our process will now yield a consistent, sustainable result that doesn't require someone to have to inspect. Um, because sometimes we get a little bit overconfident in the idea of an inspection. But so I don't need to get into all that, I guess. But the point is, well, there's a short-term corrective action to protect the customer and then a long-term corrective action, which is to truly eliminate the problem. And I think it's very critical in the successful company that I've been a part of and that I've seen, they are able to take that step from short-term to long-term corrective actions. And it's hard because once you put a short-term thing in place, all of a sudden it's not the brightest fire burning in your business and it's easy to lose track of it. So once again, that's why I mentioned before, Toyota didn't invent these principles. What I think has helped them more than anything is the discipline to follow these things. And I think that's really where if you're looking at the company and you want to do this, you also have to attack your discipline and make sure that you stay you stick with what you're doing. And for that reason, I also re recommend people start a little bit slower and just start with one thing. Start with one piece of equipment, figure everything out with that and how you want to do it, and then start to spread out or one process and then spread it out. Don't start trying to do everything at once because what will happen is you will create more problems than you can handle and it will seem insurmountable and you'll just stop doing it. So we want to track what's going on and we want to you know, start to put discipline in place. And that helps us to celebrate the results and work together with the rest of our people. So I mentioned about upskilling and doing some of those things. So what you'll see on your screen right now is you'll see a QR code. And if you scan it with your phones, it will go to a, a, a web page. And if you're looking to get more information, I'm gonna to touch on these three topics right here. If you're looking to get some more information about any one of those things, you can fill that out and you can let us know. Um, one of the things that we do and help with is like lean assessments. And I'm gonna, one of the things I'm gonna put out here is, to be honest, I think assessments can be, it can be a struggle. What I don't think anyone wants in their business is someone to come in, hand them a binder of things they're not doing right and walk away. Because at the end of the day, you probably are well aware of the things you're not doing well, um, at least plenty of them anyway, or things that you wish were better. So what our plan, what, how we handle this is we'll go in and do an assessment of the entire operation, the entire enterprise. So not just from a manufacturing standpoint, but everything, um, because they all interact and they all work together. And then we like to work with companies and help them develop um, a plan that they can do at least for the next six to 12 months. And that plan should align with any growth goals or, or company goals that you might have. Maybe you have three to five year goals, maybe you have two year goals, maybe you have 10 year goals, I'm not sure. And then as a company, what we look to is to be a partner with you. And that partnership with a lot of our clients looks different for every single one of them. Some of them, all we do is help with this assessment, help them establish their plan, and then check in with them once a quarter to see how they are doing on doing their plan. So just kind of an accountability partner with them. And that's all we do. 
some of our clients, we come in and we help train someone on site to upskill them to learn how to how to do these things and how to get better in their operations. We might come in monthly, we might come in quarterly for a week and work with them. And some of our clients, we have a couple of our consultants right now that they are full time, they are working in that business. Some of them have a lot of operations experience. They might come in and help set up uh, an operations system and then help train a replacement and then they pull out of the pull out of the operation. So we support in, in any gamut in between. The other part that we offer is do lean uh, green belt training. So if you get into any of the lean world, you're, you'll hear lean and then you also will hear Six Sigma. And we, we do both. Um, I, I like to focus more on the lean, that what that is meant to do. So lean is meant to look at my waste. So how do I take value add, non-value add, and how do I make sure that I'm focusing on, on getting rid of waste? My Six Sigma focus is a little bit more uh, heavy on statistics, and you typically need very large data sets. And, and ultimately what you're trying to do is how you eliminate variation so doing a lot of different products and stuff like that, how do I eliminate that or how do I eliminate the problems that come up with that? So both are useful. Uh, I, I recommend the lean. So our green belt training is really teaching people how to apply lean and how to get skills in doing that. Um, and our preference is that we're training people on site and they can take over everything that they're doing. One of the other, the way we also help implement lean and partner up with it from a business standpoint um, is through the 80-20 principle. This is also called the Pareto principle. And, and it's, a, it's a pretty effective business principle where 20% of whatever you wanna say, so 20% of your products account for 80% of your revenue or 80% of what you do. 20% of your clients or customers typically account for 80% of your revenue. So 20% of your efforts yield 80% of your results. And then on the flip side of that, you might have a lot of low variation stuff. So 80% of your clients, you might have clients or customers that use you for one or two things a year. Um, so they would be considered an 80, meaning that's there's 80% of them and they only account for 20% of your revenue, let's say. So what we help people with is how they identify what's called the vital few over the trivial many. So what are the vital things that I could do right now to drive um, not just the majority of my revenue, but also if I'm doing problem solving, you know, looking at a Pareto chart and understanding I might have one or two um, failure modes that are causing 80% of my rework right now. So I'm going to focus on those. Um, so, but looking at that mentality across all of my business will help grow my business with the, with the least amount of effort to be honest, because if I work on one of the vital few, one of my 20 most important products, you know, growing that by five or 10% is going to have a, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna show, I think it's about 16 times return than if you work on one of your 80%. So it's, it's gonna be a huge mover uh, in your business with taking the, a minimal amount of effort. So we do help companies with that and help them move forward and understand that. So if you want to scan that QR code, if you have any questions, um, please don't hesitate. Hopefully it's working for you. If not, uh, let me know, but, um, oops, sorry. All right, and, and that's pretty much it. You know, my contact information is there um, on the page. Rob has my contact information as well. Chuck Lynch does as well. Um, but um, there, my email is matt at, uh, ci-cg.com. Uh, my phone number is there as well. I'm happy to take any emails or, or calls or texts or anything like that uh, to help out in any way or anything like that. But um, I appreciate the time. Uh, very happy to be able to, to do this uh, with you guys. Hopefully it was uh, beneficial. Um, and then, yeah, so I'll go ahead and stop sharing now and I'll turn it back over to, to Rob. I don't know if there are any questions or anything that come up. Yeah, no, excellent job, Matt. Um, great information. It, uh, your one comment you made there, and I, I can relate to this with with my own shop is, you know, you mentioned about we we had an industry expert come in and, and sort 
start because we wanted some input on how to be more efficient. This is years ago. And actually, that was the first thing they did was actually picked on everything we were doing wrong. And just like you said, they they did leave a, a document for us to to work on, but it was it just left a negative impact. It was it was almost deflating by the time they were done. And uh, I, I really I really like what you were saying there to try and pick the positives and kind of go from there. So, um, yeah, that that was really good information. Um, yeah, a couple of questions here for you. Uh, what would be considered a good productivity efficiency to strive for, even in a small engine shop of like one to two people? Um, yeah, I think, like I said, world class that a lot of large companies look for is 80%. So I'm being 80% efficient. Um, the percentage of companies that are there is probably very, very small. Um, so I would say the first thing, like I said, I would first establish well, where am I at now? So then I can set a reasonable goal um, for what I'm doing and or where I want to be. You know, I think what you will see depending on where you're at, um, you will probably see very quickly as you just looking at it and tracking it, you will probably see an uptick. For instance, here's a great example. We just had a client that put in some dashboards that, you know, they, they, they have a couple um, parts that they put on their equipment to see how quickly, how much the, the machine is running, basically when it's running, when it's not. So what, what they found is, just tracking it, they doubled their output. And then he was like, we didn't even do anything. He's like, all we did was put up how each shift was performing and they started to just kind of do better. They didn't even know where they were at. It would be just like if you were playing a game and realized, oh, the game is really close. We just have to push a little bit and we'll, we can score the goal or get a touchdown or whatever it is and we'll be able to win. So just understanding, setting a goal you know, understanding where we're at and setting a goal, you'll start to see that. And I think it can be fluid over time. So if it were a two-person shop, you know, in all reality, I mean, maybe you're you're 30% of uptime, quote unquote, efficiency right now. Well, maybe in all reality, depending on the way your business is set up, you may not be able to get more than 60% with where you're at right now. And I think that's okay. You know, the reason I like lean is that it's it's principles. You know, there's a big reason I didn't graduate. I graduated with a degree in psychology. There's a big reason I didn't have a. I didn't graduate in like in science or any mathematics, because you got to know the answer. Psychology are principles that you use depending on the situation. To me, lean is the same way. There's no. You don't break yourself against the lean principles. You use them to accomplish what you want to accomplish. You kind of mold them and fit them to what works for you, and what works for a small shop may not work for a larger shop and, and all of that is fine um you know no one should try to be you know toyota or ford or donaher or wh whoever they are no one should try to be those companies you just take the principles and you make them yours and you fold your culture into it and and then move forward so i i think you know a goal like i said without knowing where you're at i, I mean i would say if you can if you can look at in your first round of improvement if you can look at doing a 25% improvement off of your baseline, I think that's a good good goal to put. So wherever I'm at, I want to improve that by 25%, and then let's see where I end up. Okay. Yep. No, that makes sense for sure. Um, so the same person is asking, do you also work with smaller shops of two to three, four employees? Is that something that your company works with? Yeah. Like, like I said, we... We just, uh, we work with a client here kind of in the, the Louisville, Kentucky area. Um, that's that's quite a bit smaller. They probably, uh, they're, they're probably a little more than that, but they probably have about eight or nine people in their operation uh, that they do. So I think our our goal is to, to always be a partner with people um, and to help out in any way that we can. I Because what I like to do is just figure out, okay, great. How do we apply this in that environment? Um, and I think that's what the exciting thing is about it is you can you can apply it in any situation. It just is going to look different uh, than it might, and that's and that's perfectly fine. So yeah, we do work with we do work with um, shops and, and clients of all sizes, depending on what their needs are. Okay, all right. 
Um, next question, Matt, is it, we've never done this before. Um, would you say accumulating data on a piece of equipment would be the first place to start? Um, uh, it depends. So I would say it probably depends on what your biggest need as a as a what your biggest problem is. So here's an example I, I I'll give. We worked with a client that makes very large flat saws, like that construction crews um, would buy to chop up roads and stuff like that. So they they're a smaller shop and they were fabbing everything. The entire frame, everything like that, press breaks, all that kind of stuff. They were fabbing everything up. They were doing their own powder coating, everything like that um, on, on all of their stuff. So what we first did is they also needed to get way more efficient because they were they were just bought by a very large company and they were pretty worried that they were going to shut their operation down kind of thing. So what we knew right away is typically when we go into an organization, we would say, hey, you should start with workplace organization or 5S or something like that. What I would call that is you need to start establishing standards because if you you don't know whether you made any improvements if you're not doing it the same way every time. So you need to establish standards of cleanliness, standards of processing, whatever that is. But because we knew they were not in that situation, they needed to show improvement right away. So we said, okay, that's something we need to work on, but let's start by just focusing on your processes. And they knew there was one process in the middle of their, in their whole operation that was a big bottleneck. So we didn't need to come in and do a big analysis to understand where they were at. They could tell us that, hey, we don't have a ton of data, but we know that this is a problem because it shows us that. We're always waiting on them and the people behind them, upstream for them, are piling up product to them. Okay, well, let's go to understand a little bit better. Let's make this more efficient. And once we did that, then we took an overall picture of the entire facility. And that might be called doing a value stream map or process mapping where I want to go from, from door to door, from the receiving dock until I deliver it to my customer. And I want to map out what happens and where is all my product. And then that kind of gives me a plan for where I want to attack and what I want to work on. It kind of sets my priorities for me. Um, so I would develop that and that gives me a current state of where I'm at. Then I, I do a pie in the sky future state. Where would I love to be? And then the difference, the gap between my current state and my future state, that that becomes my plan for how I'm going to get there. And so that's kind of that. I, I always say you should start with setting up standards so that you know you made improvements, but you may be in a different business condition where you need to do something different right then. And, and you probably should. Um, so I think it depends um, if you're a machine shop and you feel like you need to get more product out or you're, you're not processing stuff quickly, or you're getting, you're getting beat up on lead time or something, then, and you may not be. I know I've talked to some recent machine shops that say customers are willing to wait forever for our product because no one else is doing it, right? Um, and, and that's great, but it probably won't always be that way. The shops and the clients that will be the most successful, it matters a lot more what you do when things are going great than just as much as when things are a struggle. Because eventually we all know, you know, if you've owned a business long enough, you know it goes up and down. And it's important to, to always have that mindset that you have to get better because your, your, comp your, your competition, they're going to look to get better every day. You know, and you have to assume that's what they're doing. So sorry, that was a long-winded answer to your question. Uh, I, I, so I would say it kind of depends on what your business needs are. But if you're not 100% sure, I think it's a great place to start. Doing that, um, it may make more sense to map out your entire process and then see where should I should where should I start. Okay, yeah, great info, Matt. Um, one more question, kind of along the same lines, actually. Are they asking what tools do you recommend to transition from that short-term fix to that long-term solution? Yeah, so there are there are a lot of different methods of problem solving. Um, and all of them have their merits. Uh, I think it kind of depends on the level. Some of it may depend on even industry requirements. You know, the difference, the problem solving methodology used by the Navy is going to be vastly different than the problem solving methodology that you may need to use in, in a shop. 
um, because they might have a lot more uh, restrictions and different things and different compliance reasons that they have to do what they do. Um, we talk a lot about PDCA, uh, which is the PDCA cycle. It stands for plan, do, check, and act. And, and so what that does is you, it's very similar to what we just talked about. You make a plan, so you identify that we have a problem. And then you got to identify where do I, what do I want my result to be? So what's my goal? So if I'm seeing a, a problem and it's happening, you know, we're getting, I don't know, we're getting chatter on a valve seat. I don't know what it is, but let's say it's that. So I know there's a, an acceptable, there's a range or there's a spec on that. So I know I want to get everything that's in this spec and I want to get that 90% of the time or whatever my, I feel my capabilities are with equipment and tooling and stuff like that. Okay, well, great. Um, so now I have my goal. So now I start doing uh, root cause analysis. So I take every potential it problem that I have. So some of the things you might do is called a fishbone diagram, where I might list out all the potential reasons that I think, and I might have a discussion on whether I think it's a valid reason or not. And once I identify a couple different possible root causes, I might then do what's called a 5Y analysis on each one of those root causes, which is exactly what it sounds like you're essentially asked why five times why do i have you know chatter on my seats i don't know the the blade was wore out or the cutter was wore out or had chipped why was it chipped and I, you know so then you kind of go down that path to understand to get to the root cause and so then you would put in okay once i can identify what the root cause is um i would want to do something where i can figure if i identify the root cause then i should be able to turn that problem on and off based on what the root cause is and so once i can do that then i can fix that problem now that sounds like oh yeah let's do that and it doesn't always work that nice and neat and clean and sometimes you know sometimes you can't eliminate a problem 100 percent of the time sometimes you can only eliminate it 90 percent of the time because maybe there was a lot of other factors you weren't aware of but those are some of the tools that we do and then we might use what's called an a3 um, which is really just you know you guys might have heard a3 before you might not um, uh, an A3 really is talking about the size of paper, is literally. Um, but the the concept behind an A3 is I can have a problem on one sheet of paper, and there's a methodology to how I solve that problem uh, so that I document it and I have it available if I encounter the problem later on down the road, or if I have a, a customer that requires me to show what have you done to fix this problem, I can I can give that to them and show them here's what we did. And here's how we're putting things in place. Um, but it definitely required, you know, we, we do help people with that through different problem solving methodologies um, so that they can learn those methodologies and they can take that and they can run with it and, and empower them. Great info, Matt. Yeah, no, it, that's really good. And I, I would encourage anybody that, uh, that uh, is looking for help in this field. I mean, Matt, coming from an engine background like you did with Jasper, uh, as you can hear in his presentation, I mean, Matt literally can, he knows the jargon, he knows the lingo, uh, he's going to go into your shop and know right away what, what it is you're looking for. So, um, you know, a lot of times, and like I mentioned, Matt, when I had that efficiency expert come in, they didn't know our business at all. They didn't, I mean, it, I took more time teaching them about, you know, what a valve grinder was and what the equipment was. And it just, it was just a big waste. You know, if, again, it was, it was this big learning process that we were paying for where you have that background already, which really helps. And, uh, and for, for sure. So um, I think what we'll do to respect everybody's time, if there's any more questions that we've got, we'll make sure to forward those to Matt and uh, we'll get those over to him. And uh, Matt, I, I want to thank you. I mean, I know this takes time out of your day and, and you're busy and I don't know if this is, if this is, falls within your, your waist or if this was good, but no, you're, you're, you're definitely, uh, the information is appreciated. And again, if anybody wants to read that article that Matt did in Engine Professional Magazine, it's right there in the control panel under handouts. So do check that out. And uh, Matt, we'll let you get on with your day and thanks again for your time. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Rob. You, you bet. Um, so what I'll do now is I'm going to go back to Amanda and we will wind things down. All right, real quick, you guys, um, this, along with all our webinars, will be up on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, go out and search for Engine Builders Association and make sure to hit that subscribe button. And don't be afraid to turn on your notifications, you know, when we post new webinars. Uh, typically, they go up 
within a week, if not sooner, of when the actual live webinar takes place, and you can view any previous ones from business-related topics like this to all of our technical topics out on our YouTube channel. And then lastly, thanks as always for your time. We know you guys are all busy and you're taking time out of your day to attend these, and we truly appreciate it. Uh, when you go to leave today, a survey will pop up. Please take a moment, fill that out, let us know how we did. If you have any additional questions for Matt or for the team at AERA, there is a spot there to ask those. Also, if you ever have any ideas on something you'd like to see done as a webinar topic, go ahead and toss that in there too, and we will see what we can do. So lastly, um, you can see our AERA contact information is listed there. You can reach anyone at the AERA team by dialing 815-526-7600. And then we've also listed my email along with Rob's. You got any questions, anything for us, you can shoot us an email. And if we can't answer it, we'll get it in the hands of somebody who can. So once again, thank you everyone for your time. And we hope you have a great rest of your week.